You are listening to Literacy, a lecture that is part of the Applied Linguistics program at Macquarie University, taught by Ingrid Piller and part of the Language on the Move network. It's assignment time. We usually think about an assignment as a text that will be assessed, a literacy product. However, throughout this unit, we've talked a lot about literacy events, the literacy processes that result in a particular literacy product. So today, let's take our own medicine and let's look at the assignment as a literacy event. Basically a little how to, how, what can you do to improve your assignment and your writing processes to achieve a really high quality writing product? Let's start by looking at how the quality of the final product will be assessed. You've received a marking grid, which you should have studied very carefully by now. If you have, you've got a really good idea of expectations. If you have not, head over to iLearn and go through the marking grid and the instructions very carefully. You'll find that your assignment will be assessed on content, on organization and on format. In this unit, content accounts for 60% of the final mark, organization for 30% and format for 10%. While the ratios may differ, basically these three aspects, content, organization and format, form the basis of assessment on most academic writing. So now let's say you're aiming for top marks. The marking grid tells you what criteria the product of your writing needs to meet to achieve a score of a high distinction score. What it does not tell you is how to organize yourself so that you can actually fulfill those expectations. Because as we have discovered throughout this unit, literacy products and processes are intimately connected. So what's the process for a high distinction product? The academic writing process consists of five steps. The first one is planning. You need to figure out what is it that I have to do. As I said, that's over in the instructions in, on iLearn. You need to figure out your timeline and you need to set up your workspace. Once you've got those basics in place, then you can move on to orientation. That means you can collect your ideas and decide on the focus of your assignment. You can identify the readings that will be your key resources and if your assignment is a group assignment, then you also need to liaise with your group at that point. After you've oriented yourself, you need to move on to structuring your assignment. That's you sort your materials. That's the readings you've collected and read. And I'll get back to all the details later. Um, so you'll sort your materials and you'll set up your outline. In the next step, you'll actually be drafting your assignment. So that's that's the actual writing process, if you will. That's when you draft um, your main part, your introduction and your conclusion. Now, basically, each and every assignment consists of three parts, the introduction, the main part and the conclusion. The reason I've ordered them slightly differently here is because normally you'll be drafting your main part first and then move on to your introduction and then to your conclusion. At the drafting stage, you also need to pay attention to reader orientation and to coherence. And once you've got a solid draft in place, then you're on to the final step and that's revision. You'll run through a couple of rounds of revision. Um, you'll revise for content, you'll revise for language and style, and you'll revise for formal requirements. As a rough guide, you should allocate about 5% of your time to planning, 30% to orientation, another 30% to structuring, 25% to drafting, and 10% to revision. 
So if you have 20 hours in total for your assignment, and that's what the value of the research blog post in this unit, which is 40% of your final mark, translates to, it translates to about 20 hours of work. So if you have 20 hours of your, um, of your time for the research blog post, you should allocate one hour to planning, that's 5%, six hours to orientation, another six hours to structuring, five hours to drafting, and two hours for revision. If you have more or less time, so a longer or a shorter assignment, um, just figure out what those percentages mean in hours, what they mean specifically for your circumstances and how much time you roughly need to allocate to each of your steps. Of course, the more experience you gain or already have, the more flexible you can be. Also, make sure to keep a buffer. That's really, really important. Aim to finish well before the deadline and don't allocate all your time into one single block of time. Ideally, you would space out your 20 hours over a period of one to two weeks. Um, that's a nice little block. It shouldn't be longer either because the larger gaps you have between each steps um, that will mean, if you keep large gaps, it will mean that you need to spend extra time refreshing your memory. So that will ultimately increase the overall time you have or you need to invest. So let's now look at each of these steps in some more detail. With regard to planning, we've already spoken a bit about your timeline and I can't stress enough how important it is to read the instructions. If the instructions are unclear, ask. Being careless at this point is like setting yourself up for failure. So we've covered being clear about the task and the timeline. Now let me just say a few things about your workspace. Writing requires a room of one's own, as Virginia Woolf famously wrote in her essay about women as fiction authors. In that essay, Woolf invents a sister for William Shakespeare, Judith Shakespeare. Equally gifted as William, Judith is excluded from formal learning and she never gets a desk space of her own, the chance to write, um, a moment to concentrate. All of her talent is eaten up by household chores and family duties. Wolf's essay reminds us that writing is a privilege from which women, people of color and the poor have long been excluded. If you have the privilege to think and to write, as most people who are contemplating how to write a fabulous academic assignment will, it is your responsibility to make good use of it. So a space where you can concentrate is essential. It doesn't have to be a room of your own. It can also be desk space in our wonderful library here at Macquarie. The reason I'm talking about the responsibility of privileges. Many people today have the privilege of a workspace where they can concentrate. But many people willingly give up their space of concentration and seed it to the thrill of being always connected. So to set yourself up for academic writing success, set your phone on silent, switch off your notifications and close your background tabs in your browser. Only keep the connection to the library open and any other resources you might need for the assignment or go offline altogether. That's the only way for you to keep your concentration and to create that space where you can actually benefit from having a room of your own. Once you've put yourself in the right zone, on to orientation. The second step involves orientation. Orientation involves focusing your ideas and the only way to do so is through reading. So here is a fundamental point about writing. Reading is part of writing. If you don't read, you can't write. 
But the big question, of course, is how do I identify the right readings for your assignment? Now, for the specific assignment at hand, um, that's easy enough because I've provided you with two sets of resources, which should really suffice for the purposes of this assignment. And um, they are again in your resource pack over on iLearn. That's on the one hand, the COVID-19 archives on language on the move, and on the other, the special issue of Multilingua dedicated to linguistic diversity in a time of crisis. Although you may not need it for this specific assignment, let me just quickly run you through the process of how to identify readings for um, an assignment generally. And the basic process here is you start with your designated course readings. Um, those are available through Leganto, as you know. Um, let's, for instance, take as an example the week, the, the reading we had for week seven about linguistic diversity and education from my book, Linguistic Diversity and Social Justice. If you were to develop an assignment focusing on language, uh, linguistic diversity and education, you would start with the assigned reading and in a second step, move on to the references that are used in that chapter and you could then go on to read those references and that would be additional resources. Now, those resources, those references obviously predate the chapter and so they might in some cases be quite dated. Therefore, another way to use the assigned reading as a starting point for further reading is to check out work that cites the reading. And to do that, you can look up the chapter on Google Scholar. So you go to Google Scholar, look up the chapter, and um, that's the kind of entry you will get there. And um, I want to draw your attention specifically to the citations at the bottom of the of the actual reference where it says cited by 305 in this case. You can click on that and that will, you, will give you a list of all the references or all the resources that cite that particular chapter. And so that's current work related to linguistic diversity in education. And then you can set your further settings like from when, as in this case, you're obviously not going to go through 305 citations. So you might only look at those that have been published um, in the past 12 months or so. So starting from the course readings, from the assigned course readings, is a really good way to identify reading resources without being overwhelmed. If starting from the course readings, from the assigned readings is not enough for the kind of assignment you are writing, then um, another good way is to actually go to relevant encyclopedias and handbooks, which you can browse through multi-search or sometimes also um, on Google Books, just to get a bit of an idea. Um, handbooks like this um, excellent handbook of literacy studies that you see that you see here in the image. Another good way to actually get a feel for the field is to physically go to the shelf in the library and just browse what's there um, in the area of literacy or whatever your area is. Um, also, the more advanced you get, it's a good idea to regularly browse and um, maybe also monitor, like set up an alert for whenever new articles are published in relevant journals in our field. So um, there are there's a journal like Literacy that's really important. Applied Linguistics will be important for all of you in the Masters of Applied Linguistics and TESOL, TESOL Quarterly, Multilingua, Anthropology and Education Quarterly, and so on and so forth. So there's a fair number of journals that you could go and monitor. Now, um, the most sophisticated literature search will run through an actual keyword search. Um, there, we have a resource, a database called the Linguistics and Language Behavior Abstracts, where you could run a keyword search. Um, that's a high quality database. 
I, you need to be very careful if you go for a key term search simply through Google Scholar. While that gives you a lot of um, content and is more convenient oftentimes than logging on to LLBA, um, you have to be careful that Google Scholar doesn't actually provide any kind of quality monitoring. So you get anything that has those key terms and then you are the one who actually needs to ensure, needs to critically go through all the sources you get and evaluate whether they are trustworthy. So that might be more for those of you who are moving on to become research students. So you've identified a fair number of potential readings and you're still at the orientation stage because now you actually need to read those readings that you've identified. And um, in the following, I'm going to talk about a couple of handy hints how to actually read so that you get the most out of your reading for your assignment. So let's move on to reading and note taking. And um, let me preface this by saying reading also is um, a circular process where you go through a number of rounds to actually go deeper and deeper into a particular reading. So these very, the first circle is sort of a browsing stage and then you move on to orient yourself towards a particular reading. You question that reading, you focus the information that you need to get out of those reading and you take notes. So these are the five layers, if you will, of reading for an assignment. And let me just clarify here that reading for an assignment is quite different from academic reading for the set course readings. The set course readings, you go through the study questions and you read that reading to understand what the author is saying, to get new information, to learn. But if you read for your assignment, that's actually a different reading process because not only do you want to un note, you don't, you want to get what the author is saying, you want to understand, you want to learn, but you want to create something new. You want to create your own text. So you can no longer be driven purely by the logic of your reading. You need to create your own new logic, the logic of your own writing, the logic of your assignment. So let's say you've identified a hundred texts that look like they might be relevant. And that's not an exaggeration. That can easily happen if you follow any of the processes that um, we've been looking at. And even just for um, the two resources that you need for um, this particular assignment, the COVID-19 archives on language on the move and um, the special issue of multilingua, these together will give you around 50 articles. Now 50 articles still is way too much of what you actually need for your assignment. So you need to identify those specific resources that you want to read in depth. So you first start by browsing. Browsing um, is basically, well, you've looked at the heading already and you have identified they're potentially relevant. So next you look at the abstract, you look at the table of contents, um, you leave through a text, you skim read, and you pay particular attention to attention grabs. Attention grabs are like subheadings or anything that's in bold or maybe a diagram or something that looks clearly like a summary. So you browse all the texts that you have identified as potential resources and um, in this browsing process you will eliminate a fair number. Um, a, a really rough guide would be like 50% of the resources you've identified. If you've identified 50 resources for um, an assignment like this one for which you need five to 10 resources, um, then you can at the browsing stage eliminate 25 resources. So that's 50%. 
And then that gives you already a smaller set that you want to um, look at in greater detail, that you want to really orient towards. And at the orientation stage, you'll actually read the introduction. You'll read the first sentence of all the paragraphs and you'll read the conclusion. So this gives you um, another layer, a greater le um, level of depth related to that reading. And you will find um, a bit of information that is relevant, but you will find that an even smaller subset now, you really want to engage with quite carefully. You want to question a subset of those. So your orientation allows you to identify the most critical resources that will help you most to shape your own assignment, to shape your argument. And so you want to really carefully question a relatively small set of um, resources, maybe those five to tens that really form the foundation of your assignment. And when I say you want to question those, I mean that not only do you read the introduction, the conclusion, first sentences, so you already have a good idea of the argument, you really now read these in depth and you interrogate them as what is it that I actually want to get out of this text. So you're no longer driven by the logic of the text. You're driven by your own questions. Why am I reading this? What do I want to know? Uh, what do I know and what do I want to know? So these are the two questions that you want to ask. And um, once you've identified what it is that you want to know and what these texts can give you, then you can give those the small subset, as I said, maybe five to ten reading resources. You can give them a really focused read. And by focused read, I mean you can go and highlight key terms and key content. Now, um, when I say highlight key terms and key content, I'm assuming that you are reading this digitally where you can easily fiddle with the text. Um, never, never, ever highlight in library books. So um, if you are using library books here, then obviously move on straight to note taking and create your own paper. Um, so highlighting key terms happens digitally, if, if on hard copies, then only on photocopies, obviously. Um, another really good way to focus on a reading to get an in-depth understanding is to actually write down your own reflections. Again, if you are reading digitally, you can do that into the text. Um, you can also put your reflections into a database like EndNote, for instance, if you are using databases or alternatively, you can create another file. Um, either on Word or even write physical notes, if that's what you prefer, where you note um, your reflections related to that questioning stage. What is it that I want to know? What is it that I'm getting out of this particular text? And from there, that's sort of these reflections form the basis for your notes. So um, the notes will really be created on the basis of rereading your highlights. And that's why highlighting is just a really good tool because then this gives you yet another level of reading where you can really deepen your understanding and um, then your actual notes are um, a summary and um, then comes the key point, the integration into your own structure. And one thing that I can't stress enough is that reading for an assignment is really a very special process. It's very different, of course, from reading for pleasure, as you will have noticed by, you know, all these various layers of reading, but it's also very different from reading a set text, reading just to learn, reading to get your head around the content in the unit. So 
at this stage where you read for the assignment, you actually need to um, engage in a creative process where reading leads to writing and where your reading is ultimately driven by your own arguments. So where you integrate bits and pieces that you take from your resources into your own new structure. So those key building blocks that you've taken from your reading, they then form the building blocks of something new and that something new is your assignment. Okay, so now you've collected all your readings and you've structured them into something new. You've created an outline for your assignment. You know what it is that you want to argue what it is that you want to show, what kind of research you want to present, and so now on to the drafting stage. Um, I've got this beautiful Persian rug here because drafting a text is like weaving a carpet, and I haven't made that up. That metaphor is actually underlying the word for text. The word text is the past participle of the Latin verb texere. And texere means to weave in Latin. So a text in Latin is something that is woven. The text is the woven. And I think it's a beautiful metaphor and one that everyone should keep in mind what you need to do when you put together your own writing, when you put together your assignment is you're aiming for um, a beautiful weave where all the um, various threads connect to create something new and beautiful. And what it is that you aim to connect is really a whole that provides answers, that provides, and does so implicitly, that provides answers to the following questions. What is the research problem? What is the context and background? What are the most important relevant research findings? What are their implications? And what is the take home message for your audience? So that's what you're aiming to weave together when you draft your text. Now, it may well be that your text doesn't quite look like this beautiful Persian carpet, but looks more like these kinds of exercise practice woven bits. And that's perfectly fine because that's what your assignment ultimately is. It is a practice text. And um, as long as you keep the goal in mind, um, it'll be fine. In addition to weaving the various strands together to create that beautiful, connected, well-connected text, you also need to keep your reader in mind. That's the basic virtue of all writers. Keep the reader in mind. And you may think, oh, that assignment is, you know, it's just for my marks and my assessment. Well, someone has to mark that assignment. And um, it really will make a difference whether you speak to them or whether you don't. So it's a good and, and ultimately, of course, the point of writing is to reach an audience. So keep your audience in mind. Keep your reader in mind. Um, Joseph Pulitzer, an American journalist after whom um, the famous Pulitzer Prize is named, um, identified the following writer's virtue. Put it before them briefly so that they will read it clearly so that they will appreciate it picturesquely so that they will remember it and above all accurately so they will be guided by its light. And that brings us to the question really what is the point of academic writing? Why are we writing academically? It's obviously quite different from um, Pulitzer's journalistic writing. It's quite different from fictional writing. Why do we bother and write assignments? Um, so what's the point? Well, one clear point is to learn. It's we write to learn in the same way that throughout a lot of your, our studies, we read to learn. Writing creates another 
higher level of learning in that it allows us to synthesize existing knowledge and create new knowledge. And all new knowledge carries within it the responsibility to disseminate it. So that's why we actually spend so much time on learning how to write academically and practice all those assignments that so many of you don't particularly like. It's actually because we have the privilege of learning and the privilege of researching and creating knowledge and that privilege carries with it the obligation to actually disseminate that knowledge and the only way to do that or one of the key ways to do that is through academic writing. And before you know it you're on to the final stage of your assignment writing and that final stage is revision. Now I know from experience that that is the stage that so many students skip. Don't skip it. Don't submit anything that has not been properly revised. Um, it will immensely enhance the quality of your final product if you actually also make sure to properly engage in this final step of revision you revise for content. So you actually go through with a fine comb. Does my argument actually make sense? Interrogate it. Get some feedback maybe. You review your connections. What's the connection between this sentence and that sentence? Have I properly explained how this paragraph need, leads to the next paragraph? And also make sure to review your key terms um, and your quotes. So you revise for content. That's one stage of revision. Another round of revision, and of course they are all interconnected, but you really need to go through a couple of rounds of revision. Another round of revision, you make sure to actually revise for language and style. As much as possible, simplify, clarify, make sure to be to the point. Always keep a dictionary and a thesaurus handy. It's always a good idea to figure out, is there a better way of saying this? How can I make sure not to repeat the same word over and over again? And keep in mind, you're very um, fortunate today that you know having an online dictionary open, so to speak, while you write or a thesaurus at your fingertips. Um, that's a great way to actually improve the language and the style of your writing. And the same is true for your style guide. Um, have your APA style guide, but also more general style guides like the Macquarie style guides, for instance, have them handy and peruse them regularly. They are great ways to um, enjoy some reading all around. Avoid jargon and bandwagons and um, make sure to um, actually don't give us those kinds of long garden path sentences. Consider rewriting any sentence that has more than 30 words. The ideal sentence length, as you will remember from when we spoke about levels of literacy and um, about um, flesh reading ease and all those kinds of metrics, the ideal sentence length in English is 14 words. And also, I can't stress that enough, um, revise for formal requirements. Is the assignment actually complete? And I can tell you, um, each and year when I get this research blog post, I will get a couple of people who've actually forgotten to add the reflection. Now, there needs to be a reflection. You need to make sure that your assignment, your assignment is complete and has all the elements that are required, that all the references are there and so on and so forth, that it is consistent and um, that it is correct, like correct, it meets exactly the word limit, for instance, and um, it meets all other formal requirements. And once you've um, been through a couple of rounds of revision, aim for very good, don't aim for perfect because perfect is the enemy of the good, unfortunately, so it'll never be perfect, but make sure it's as good as it possibly can be and 
as you can say with a good conscience, I've gone through all these steps, I've dedicated myself, um, I've been careful, and once you've reached that stage, you're done, it's over, submit it, and sit back and move on to the next assignment.